I just want you to remember, in terms of integration, right? We used integration, we encountered the idea to solve a particular kind of problem. What kind of problem was it? Area. It was area, right? Where are my colors? Um, we learned that if you take a function, right, if you take a function, and you want to consider the area beneath it, yeah? You can consider it as a whole bunch of really, really thin vertical rectangles, right? Just being subtle. <laughs> And so you add these things up, right? You add them up. So for example, in this case, if I just said, you know, maybe this is y equals x squared, okay? The way I would form this integral is I would say, okay, uh, sorry, form this area is you get your upper lower bounds, right? And then you would say integrate y with respect to x, right? So that would be x squared dx. You get x cubed on three. You'd evaluate at the boundaries and so on. Does that make sense? Now, one of the reasons why I write y instead of x squared is to help you remember that these two things here are the height and width of a rectangle, right? Each of these is uh, dx, y, there's that infinitesimally thin width, and their y height, right? And the y keeps on changing, so you have a whole bunch of different rectangles. So far, so good? Now, that was one thing we could do. You could add up other things as well, though. You don't have to have rectangles that are upright. You could have rectangles like this, that are sideways, yeah? Now, I would form a different integral to find this area. What would I, sorry, what would I form if I wanted to say, cut away, yeah? OK, now, I'm going to need, yeah, I'll, I, I can put that bit in. Um, I've got my x's. OK, now, what does x represent in this case? It's these widths, right? And the widths are all changing, yes? X. And the dy is the height, okay? And that's that little infinitesimally thing. Um, you're going to need some boundaries as well. Um, I'm rather than writing A and B, because they're usually reserved for a horizontal thing, the boundaries here are going to be vertical boundaries, right? They're y coordinates. So maybe this value and this value. So maybe just for convenience sake, we'll call them C and D, okay? So we could form integrals like that. And we said, look, you know what? You don't have to just be limited to rectangles, right? I said, go back to the humble circle, right? And the, we, we know really well the formula for the area of a circle and the formula for the circumference of a circle, right? And we said that those are connected by saying, if you add up a whole bunch of circumferences, right? And how would I do that? I would say the area equals each circumference is 2 pi r. Do you remember that? What's the width of each one? It's going to be dr. That's the thing that's changing, the radius each time. The smallest circle has a radius of 0. The biggest one has a radius of r. And off you go, right? So you can do rectangles standing up, rectangles sideways, circumferences, right? You can add up, you can integrate anything you like, which is what leads us to this graph. Now, we're going to integrate something completely different. In fact, we're even going to be in a different dimension. But to help you understand what's going on, I need you to take this graph. And we'll just call it, you know, y equals any old function of x. Okay? And we want to think about, well, if I take this and get an area underneath this curve. So, for example, let's have a boundary A and boundary B. And I already know what kind of integral I can form in order to find this area underneath the curve. That's fine, okay? But I'm interested in doing something a little more interesting. I'm interested in taking this area, the one that I just described, and rotating it around an axis, like, say, the x-axis, okay? <coughs> now, this is a bit weird conceptually. I'm going to draw it here. I want you to work with me. And then I'm going to show you what this looks like. I'm going to animate it for you, okay? Um, but it's really important that you do this work first so that your brain goes through the process. Okay, I'll try and justify that more in a second. Um, I want you to imagine like a potter's wheel, okay? If you imagine a potter's wheel spinning around and around like this, okay? And you're kind of like holding your hands in so that you get this kind of shape, right? What you're going to get is a shape that looks just like this, reflected downwards, right? So for example, if you go the same distance there and the same distance about there, you're going to get that shape on the other side, right? Because remember, it's going round and round and round, being the same shape on both sides. But because it's going around in a circle, you get a round shape, OK? So you get this kind of thing. Okay. Now, 
This is not an area like this, okay? This is a 3D shape. It's a solid, right? Like, just like if you had a potter's wheel and you were, you know, ta-da, here's my thing. It's an actual physical 3D shape, okay? Because it's a solid that's formed by rotating this thing around, right, by revolving it around an axis, we call this kind of shape a solid of revolution. Solid of revolution. And we are no longer finding an area. We are going to find the volume of this thing. Okay? So the question then becomes, well, how do I find the volume of this shape? And the answer is, in exactly the same way that we looked at all of these shapes, you took one part, right? you added up a whole bunch of them, you integrated them all together. So the question is, what kinds of parts can we divide this up into and then combine those together to get this shape? Yeah, I mean, so. Okay, very good. If I went across here, right, with a knife, and sliced it across this way, right, um, kind of like cutting up salami, right, what I would get is a whole bunch of slices that are all circular, every single one. Okay, so I'm going to draw one in the middle, and we're going to use it as an example. Okay, so I'm going to take a spot like here, right in the middle. Okay, now every time I slice across, I'm going to get this kind of circular shape, right? Like that, okay? Now, just like we had here, rectangles that were kind of like infinitesimally thin or rectangles that were infinitesimally uh, high, okay? I'm going to think of this, this whole thing's meant to be a volume, right? So in fact, that thing there, I want to consider it as a tiny infinitesimally thin cylinder. Okay? So give it for me a tiny bit of width, just like those guys are meant to have, you know, each of these is actually infinitesimally wide. Okay? So I'm going to draw this with a little bit of width, like so. Okay? So it's like a little disc, if you like. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that disc and I'm put it, going to put it off on the side here, so I can consider it just on its own. So this is like a little slice of my solid of revolution. Okay? Now what do I know about it? Well, just like we said, it's infinitesimally thin. Just like our original integrals were infinitesimally thin. So I'm going to call that width, just like I've given it a name already, I'm going to call that dx. Okay? That's my infinitesimally thin width there. Right? It's a cylinder, so this width here is kind of like the height of the cylinder. You're kind of looking at it sideways, right? What other dimension do I need to know the volume of this cylinder? I need its radius, don't I? That radius is this height here. Okay. Now, that height here is whatever this y value is. Do you see that? Like That tells you how tall, how wide this, um, this cylindrical disk is going to get. I already have a name for this. It's the same thing I had over here. right? This radius is the same as this length right, up here, the height of those integrals over there. So this is really just y. I know the radius, I know the height of the cylinder. What's the volume of this particular cylinder here? <coughs> pi, pi times the radius squared, which is y squared, times the height, which is dx. Right. That is, and just to put it there, right, this is the equivalent of pi r squared h. You see that? That's just the volume of the cylinder. Okay? But that's just one of them. I don't want just one of them. I want all of them all together. Okay? And that's exactly what integration does. It's like, I don't just want this one. I want all of them. Right? So in order to get the total volume, okay, so this is just um, of one slice. Okay? The total volume is all of those slices added together, right? And I already have created, I've gone to great lengths to create the notation and the language to describe that, right? I want the integral, right, from one boundary to the other one, A to B, of all these guys, all these cylinders, pi y squared dx, okay? This will give me the volume of this weird rotated shape. Yes? Um, instead of doing that, would you find the value of A to B like, the, like it, um, in a 2D shape? You mean the area? Yeah, find the, the area, area in yes. a 2D shape. 
and then times it by the circumference of the largest circle. Okay, I'm going to let you have a think about why that would have serious troubles, okay? Um, what we're considering is just that area, right? And then thinking about this circumference here, okay? It's problematic to say the least. I want you to actually try the numbers. Crunch okay. the numbers and see why it doesn't work. There's a reason why we chose to divide it into these cylindrical kinds of shapes, okay? Partly because I get cylinders of this kind everywhere, no matter where I cut, okay? Which is why I can add up a whole bunch of them in series, okay? 